So Dr. Byington and I are really looking forward to being able to share with you information about colorectal cancer. And what we'll talk about first is how preventable it is. Often you'll see uh, advertisements about getting colorectal screening. And so the American C Cancer Society has one that's out that's kind of sweet, and I'm going to show this to you. It promotes having courage getting colorectal screening. Don't die of embarrassment. Get a colorectal exam. And this one talks about the Wizard of Oz and the cowardly lion who needs courage. But the witch says, I'm over 50. I need a colorectal exam. <laughs> so we'll be talking about today the, how common colorectal cancer is, what it is, what causes it, what are the risk factors, and can colorectal cancer be prevented, and how do we find colorectal cancer early? How common is colorectal cancer? It's the third most common cancer in both men and women in the United States. It's the second leading cause of cancer-related death in the U.S. when men and women are combined. Does anybody know what the first one is as far as cancer? Lung. lung. Correct, lung. It is estimated that more than one half of all cases could be prevented by regular colonoscopy screening. So let's look at some statistics from 2013, which is the most recent statistics I could look at. 1,390,000 1, people in the United States got colon cancer. Think of it. What if we could prevent one half of those cases by regular colonoscopy screening? That's pretty amazing. What is colorectal cancer? The colon is also known as the large bowel or intestine. It's about five feet long. It's part of our digestive system. It absorbs water and salt, nutrients, minerals, and it stores waste material. The rectum is the last six inches of the colon. When you look at the colon, there's different parts of it. The ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, and the rectum. When a colon cancer is found, often that area where it is found will be used as a descriptor. So the colon cancer was found in the descending colon. And that just helps to understand the location and also possible surgical options. Rectal cancer location, of course, um, also indicates what kind of surgical options there are. Radiation treatment is often focused more in the rectum. Um, and so that location is important to know. But uh, just realizing that that location really can impact how treatable the disease is. So we know that cancer is a growth of abnormal cells. And cancer cells invade and damage normal tissue. Colorectal cancer starts in the colon or the rectum. Colorectal cancer is often abbreviated CRC. Colorectal cancer can develop from a polyp, and you'll be hearing a lot about that from both me and from Dr. Byington today. When we look at, imagine this is a colon, the inside of the colon. Up here is considered a polyp. Then stage zero is when it's a little larger. Stage one is when it has invaded into some of the underlying tissue. Stage three, you can see where it invades even deeper into the surrounding tissue and often into the lymph nodes, which are the little green colored um, items. And then stage four, colorectal cancer often is larger, but the concern with stage four is that it has spread to other organs, and so it's considered metastasized. How we will know when a colon cancer spreads to another organ is we may do a CAT scan and look at the abdomen or the lung to see if there's any other abnormalities that show up that could be um, related to the colon cancer. 
and then we'll prove that by biopsying that area. For example, if there's an area nodule in the lung, we will try to biopsy that area. A surgeon will biopsy that area and determine, is that look just like that colorectal cancer in the colon? And often that's the case. That will all determine how the patient will be treated as far as just surgery. If it's a low stage, often a stage one, we can manage just with surgery. Um, stage two, three, and four, depending on the different kinds of factors that are involved in the colorectal cancer, will determine the kind of chemotherapy or the other kind of treatment that is offered. So what are the causes of colorectal cancer? We don't know the cause of most colorectal cancers. I wish we did. You know, medicine is a fine science, but we are not all knowing. Most likely cause is related to changes in the genetic material or the DNA in our cells. We do know that there can be DNA changes related to our lifestyle that cause colorectal cancer, and we'll talk about more of those. Here are some of the risk factors. Risk factors are anything that can increase or decrease a person's chance of getting a disease such as cancer. Age, most colorectal cancer occurs in age 50 or older. Diet, diet high in red meats and processed foods increases risk. Diets high in fat increases risk. High, diets high in fruits and vegetables decreases risk. And there are some recommendations of even kinds of of uh, fruits and vegetables that can help decrease risk. There's literature out talking about cit citrus fruits being helpful to decrease risk. Green leafy vegetables can decrease risk. Physical activity. The less active we are, the increased risk. Overweight, obesity does increase the risk of having and dying from colorectal cancer. Smoking increases risk and also increases risk of dying. So not only having, but dying from colorectal cancer with patients who smoke. Alcohol increases risk. Type 2 diabetes has been found to increase risk. Inflammatory bowel disease, such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, can increase risk. However, inflammatory bowel disease is not a risk factor. Other risk factors, those that have had colorectal cancer in the past. Say, for example, there was a patient that came in and was found to have a stage one colorectal cancer. That person would need to be monitored even more closely for recurrence. The risk is higher if the colorectal cancer occurred at a younger age. Definitely talk to your daughter, doctor right away if you or people in your family have any of these risk factors. And Dr. Byington will be talking to you more about signs and symptoms of colorectal cancer. Polyps. A polyp is a growth of tissue in the lining of an organ. There's two types of colorectal polyps, hyperplastic, which is, has a very small chance of developing a cancer. Adenomatous is one that is more likely to develop into a colon cancer. They often will start as adenomas or adenomatous polyps. That's a mouthful. Major risk factors, a personal history or family history of adenomatous polyps or colorectal cancer, or certain inherited syndromes. So there's a normal colon on a colonoscopy on your left. This is actually um, many little polyps. Sometimes um, gastroenterologists will just say little red spots, but little red or little polyps. And in this particular patient, they have adenomatous polyposis, which is um, a family hereditary disease where there are large amounts of polyps that develop. So be brave and help your family members be brave. Be a colonoscopy warrior. Like this fellow, fun funnily enough, I always seem to get a spare seat beside me on the bus. Maybe it has something to do with his T-shirt. I don't know. <laughs> Dr. Cindy Byington will talk further to you about uh, the screening of colorectal cancer, and then I'm happy to answer any questions as they come up. But I have a couple for you. 
So what factors do you think prevent people from getting colorectal screening? Okay, embarrassment, ignorance. Fear of something will go wrong, like proliferating COVID. Okay, that's that's true. Okay, anything else? Fear that they might actually find something wrong. That kind of fatalistic view of what might happen. Right. Yeah. What is the? What's that? Oh, yes. What if we don't like the preparation of, for the colorectal cancer? And we are trying to find a little easier ways, but the bottom line is, is that we definitely need to see the colon cleared out to be able to uh, visualize the colon appropriate. Because you can imagine some of those little areas, those little polyps, they can be as small as the head of a pen. Mm -hmm. And so it's so important that people's bowels is cleaned out and using uh, the person who ordered the GI prep in vain, using their name in vain is allowed, but that prep is really important. <laughs> so other areas that we have to take responsibility for, for people not getting colorectal screening, are the fact that they don't get recommendations from their healthcare providers. And that's why it's really important when people come to these kinds of, of meetings and information, then you, you are empowered to, to share and spread the world. Uh, spread the word to the world and be um, that colonoscopy warrior. There can be lack of symptoms, and so if we don't notice anything's going on, why would we go ask a doctor to have a colonoscopy? So that is one question that comes up. One that's really interesting to me is that being unmarried also decreases your interest in getting a colorectal screening. Nobody's prodding you along. And so, Does that work for women and men? Yes, for women and men. Interesting. And then we also always have the lack of time. But you are very well informed. You know of many of the reasons why people don't get colorectal screenings. And we're hopeful now that with new information, you'll go forth and spread the word. So, Dr. Byington? Can you guys hear me okay? All right, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. I actually have a really big interest in colorectal cancer, and we'll get to that later about why. But it's not just, it's part of my job. I have to tell you to do, go get your colonoscopy. I really am interested in it. Um, let me find the clicker. Okay, so why do we do these screenings? As Diane said, you can't talk about prevention unless we talk about screening. They go hand in hand. Um, the goal of any good screening program is to prevent disease or to catch the disease early enough that we're able to treat it and do something about it. With colorectal cancer screening, we are specifically looking for a few things, polyps and abnormal areas of tissue that can be removed and prevent transformation into cancer, early cancer detection to facilitate early treatment, and you get the added benefit of identifying any changes in the colon that may otherwise affect your health. You probably all know that the earlier we find a, any cancer the, during a screening exam, the better. It's impressive to see that a stage one cancer that we find at five years, 94% of those patients are still living and doing well. As that goes down, our stage fours at five years, most of them don't make it. So the earlier we find something, the better. Screening exams allow us to identify these and get started with treatment. So when should you start screening? 50 is always the magic number we hear, right? And that's the easy answer. For someone who is at average risk, meaning most of the population, the easy answer is start at 50 years old. And that screening should be continued until you're at least 75, with a few exceptions. Because it takes some time for a colon cancer to develop, we usually say five, 10 years. When you get to 75, we take a closer look at, is this the right test to continue doing for you? And there's a lot of factors that are involved in that, including your health status, your goals of care. You know, if we find something, would you want to do anything about it? And so that's a discussion that you need to have with your physician and go over in detail, is this something we should continue doing? 
There are special circumstances when screening tests need to be started before age 50. The most, and this can get confusing, but the most common scenario is when you have a relative who has had colon cancer. This applies only to first degree relatives. So your father, mother, brother, sister, or child. It doesn't count aunts and uncles, it doesn't count your grandparents. And we look at it a couple of ways. When you have one first degree relative who is diagnosed with a colorectal cancer before they reach the age of 60, or when you have two relatives, first degree relatives, that have had a colorectal cancer diagnosis regardless of how old they were, that puts you into this special category. And when you're in this category, you're gonna get your first screening exam at the latest by age 40. The caveat to that is you may start them earlier depending on when your relatives were diagnosed. And that would be 10 years before the youngest one at diagnosis. So for example, if your dad had colon cancer when he was 47, you're gonna to wanna to start screening at age 37, so 10 years before his diagnosis. If your dad had colon cancer at age 55, 10 years before that would be 45, but we don't want that. We want the minimum age to be 40, so you would start at 40 in that scenario. Uh, another special circumstance that Diane talked about is our inflammatory bowel disease. These are quite prevalent, a lot of people have been diagnosed with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and they're in a special category with screening. And I wanna reiterate, this is not irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome. This is a different entity. And because they have a lot of damage going on in their colon, depending on the severity of their disease, they're at higher risk of having those DNA changes, and those DNA changes can lead to a colon cancer. And so, there's specific recommendations based on the location of the disease, the duration that you've had it, how severe it is, and your specific diagnosis. And that needs to be discussed with your gastroenterologist or your primary care physician to determine what the right schedule is for you. Typically, after a period of time, it's every year that you need to be doing something. So now that you know why, who, and when we screen, Let's talk about how we screen. There are other options other than a colonoscopy. There's basically two categories. One is the stool-based test, and the other is the direct visualization test, and we're gonna go through each of these. The first one is our guaiac or fecal occult blood test. It's probably the simplest and the most inexpensive test uh, for screening that we have. It involves the collection of three separate stool samples, which you're gonna do at home, um, and then they're tested for the presence of blood that's not visible to the naked eye. As you saw in the pictures earlier, we get those polyps that can turn into a colon cancer and colon cancers invade the tissue. That can cause bleeding and that's what we're looking for in these samples is blood as a sign that something's not right. There are some diet recommendations that go along with this test. Um, although the tests say that they don't interact, there's also recommendations that said you should, you should avoid these few things prior to testing, and that would be red meats because of the blood issue. Vitamin C can interact with it, and NSAIDs like your ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, because those can predispose you to bleeding when you may not otherwise. The caveat to using this screening test is it has to be done on a newer version. Um, we used to have a Hemocult 2, now we have Hemocult Sensa. So if you're doing this, make sure your doctor's got the right test. And then this screening has to be repeated every year because it's just not sensitive enough to pick up things. The FIT test is a newer one. It's the fecal immunochemical test, and it's basically a fancier version of our GUIAC test. Um, it's also looking for blood. It uses a better, new, fancy method of detecting the blood, though. It's more sensitive, and, but it is about double the price, which is still not much less than $50 probably. Uh, has the benefit that you only have to do one stool sample, but again, because it's not as sensitive of, uh, as other tests, it has to be repeated every single year. And then, they like this test so much, they made it even better. So we have the FIT DNA test. This one takes the FIT test, looking for blood, and then adds on another test looking for markers that can show up in DNA that are, usually associated with colorectal cancer. So if you think about, and this, this is a lunch talk, but we're gonna talk about poop. If you think about stool coming through the colon and brushing up against one of those polyps or a cancer, it's gonna pick up some tissue in there. 
And as that stool comes out, we're gonna test it to see if any of that tissue that got picked up is positive for these DNA markers. This test is a lot more expensive. It runs about $600 from what, what I found on Google. Um, but it only requires one stool sample. Um, the other caveat to this one, it's, it's fairly new still and we don't have all the details we need, but we do know it's causing a lot of false positive results. And so you may do the test, come out positive, you move on and we don't find anything. And we're not sure what to do with that result. Um, the other thing with this one is we don't know the ideal time frame for repeating it. So right now the recommendation is between one and three years. More will be coming out on this though. You'll probably see it in the news. And then we have our favorite, the colonoscopy. <laughs> it's the test everyone loves to hate. And we've already talked about the dreaded prep. Um, I'm sure many of you have experienced it, and most of you have probably heard about the prep. However, colonoscopy can be a very effective means of screening because it provides an avenue to treat the polyps and take biopsies of abnormal tissue at the time of the screening exam. Thus, you're, getting, you're preventing delays in care and treatment should something be identified. The procedure is more elaborate. It has a lot more requirements than the simple stool test, including the prep the night before to cleanse the colon, and we cleanse it. Uh, diet modifications during the cleanse and the need for conscious sedation, and that can be a caveat for some patients with lung disease. We can't do the con conscious sedation on them. Uh, the procedure also has to be done in a clinic or in a hospital. This isn't something you can do at home. It takes a professional, and it will require you to take a day off of work to get it all done. The cost of the procedure is much higher than our stool-based testing, but if nothing is found, no polyps, no abnormal tissues, it's only done once every 10 years. So if you kind of average it out, it makes sense. Um, and then for those of you who ha haven't had the pleasure of a colonoscopy, here's a picture of how we do it. We use a camera attached to a flexible straw, basically. It's called a scope, and that goes through the rectum, and we feed it all the way through to the end of the colon at the cecum, where the colon and the small bowel connect. And then the provider looks at the tissue very carefully to see if there are any abnormalities. We also have the option of a flexible sigmoidoscopy. This is another tool that we can use as screening, but it's become much less popular, and you'll understand why in a second. It works just like a colonoscopy, utilizing a scope, but it's much shorter. And the benefits of treating with this method is that we don't need the conscious sedation. So those patients with the lung diseases that we can't put to sleep, it's a better option for them. And the bowel prep is not as bad with this one as well. Uh, because it, the scope only goes 60 centimeters into the colon with this one, it's often combined with the FIT testing, looking for the blood, and that increases its sensitivity. This test does need to re be repeated every five years if you choose to go this route. And here's an example of what we're looking at with a SIG. So a colonoscopy is represented in yellow. It's going to go all the way down to the cecum where that connects to the small bowel. And there's appendix right there. Your flex SIG is only going to go 60 centimeters in. And you can see this isn't going to cover everything. You have no idea what's going on over here with the flex SIG. And so that's why it's falling out of popularity at this point. And then we have our new fancy test. It's called the CT colonography or virtual colonoscopy. And it sounds fabulous until you learn more about it. It's one of our newer screening tests. And with advancement in technology, it's becoming even better all the time. So they're getting to where they can really see things very well. It uses a CT scan to image the large bowel and create a 3D picture. The downside to this is it does have a higher cost, there's exposure to radiation involved with this, and you still need to do the prep. We've got to have it clean. For those of you who are thinking this sounds like a pretty good idea, there's no scope going up there, that's not true. Um, these pictures are only pretty because we stick 
a rectal tube in and inflate the bowel. So there's still that part of it. And they inflate the bowel to get rid of all of the wrinkles and just kind of stretch it out like a balloon so they can really see inside, see if there's any abnormalities there. And here's a picture of what we can do with that. It's, they're very good pictures, actually. So here's your bowel, and the computer generates a 3D picture of it, and it's nice and inflated. And then from that 3D picture, they can make a model of the inside and look to see if there's any polyps in there. It's great. But with any of these screening methods, it's important to remember to talk with your doctor. Determine what's best for you and what's best for your risk factors and your general health. And remember, if you are choosing a test other than a colonoscopy, consider what's going to happen if you get a positive result. If you do this CT colonography and there's something in there, you're still going to get a colonoscopy. And because of that, most of us as as providers recommend, we just go directly with colonoscopy. It's the exam of choice for most of us because once we're in there, we can take care of and biopsy any abnormalities that we find. All right, now that we've covered all of the tests, there, well, let me, there are other tests available, and I didn't go over them. The ones I didn't go over have not been proven to be very effective or sensitive, and that's why I chose to leave them out. But there, there's still new things coming out all the time. Um, so those are all of our available screening methods. Let's talk about what signs and symptoms that you may experience that could represent a colorectal cancer. And I want to remind you that the first symptoms of a cancer are no symptoms. So we typically do not see any of these signs until the cancer has developed into one of those later stages. First thing you might see is a change in bowel habits. You may be regular for the last 20 years of your life and all of a sudden you've got diarrhea that does not want to go away. That is a sign that something's not right. Vice versa, you may be constipated all the time and now you've got diarrhea or diarrhea and now constipated. Anything that's a change from your normal that is persistent and doesn't resolve needs to be looked at further as it could be a sign. Change in well, change in stool caliber is another one. Um, sometimes we see tumors that grow in a circle. And as that grows and enlarges, it makes it harder for the stool to pass. And the stool comes out thin. And so you might hear the term pencil-thin stools. That would be another sign to look for. The feeling that you need to have a bowel movement that's not relieved by having one. So when we get tumors in the rectum, it can give the sensation of fullness. And then you get this feeling of, I got to go. You go to the bathroom. You still feel like you got to go. So that is another sign that you want to look for. Blood in the stool, like we talked about. This is a big one. Most of the time, we can't see it. And that's why we're using those tests to look for it. But blood in the stool is always something you want to see your doctor about. It can come as bright red blood. It can come as a dark maroon colored stool. Or it can come as dark black stools can have many colors. It also might be present on tissue paper when wiping. So any of those is a reason to go get checked. Cramping and stomach pain. This is a hard one because who hasn't ever had cramping and stomach pain? Doesn't mean you have colon cancer, but if things just don't seem right and it doesn't get better, that's something you need to think about and come in and get checked. Weakness and fatigue. Fatigue is a common complaint, and it can be a result of that continuous, minuscule amount of blood loss that can happen with a colon cancer. It, tend, it will lead you to becoming anemic, and that's going to make you feel tired and run down. On the reverse side of that, if you're in doing your regular labs and we find anemia, we're going to start thinking about, is there something going on in the colon, given the right population age? And then unintended weight loss. How much weight loss is too much weight loss? That's the question, right? Um, as tumors grow, they can utilize more energy and nutrients than what your body is used to providing, and so you can slowly lose weight with that. And what we consider significant is anything more than 5% of your usual body weight over a 6 to 12 month period. 
So for a 200 pound person, that's 10 pounds over six months. It's not much. Before we leave, I wanted to share with you why I'm so passionate about a col uh, colorectal cancer. And this is my personal experience with it. These are my grandparents. This is Dolores and Jay. And they lived next door to me, so they were right there for me all the time. Um, Grandpa was a farmer most of his life. He did cows and potatoes and all the usual stuff, and then later on went to work for the John Deere company. He was, as farmers are, tough as nails, never complained, didn't have anything wrong, and as such, never went to the doctor. He was of the opinion that if it's not broke, don't fix it. He was overweight. He ate the typical farmer lifestyle diet of meat and potatoes every day. And he thought, though he was active when he was younger, he had become quite the couch potato after retirement. I remember Christmas Day when I was 16. The entire family joined together for our usual Christmas festivities at Grandma and Grandpa's house. And after we had ate and had presents, the topic of conversation turned to how Grandpa didn't look like he was feeling well. One aunt commented, you know, he seems to look skinnier than he used to. Another person says, his skin looks a little yellow. It's just not quite right. Grandma pipes in, you know, his energy's been really low lately. Just can't do what he used to. Grandpa sitting in his recliner with his arms crossed, muttering to himself about how we all need to stop worrying about him, right? We all know these guys. But now you know where I'm going with this. After some coaxing, he finally went to the doctor, colonoscopy got done, and at that point, it was too late. He had stage four, it had metastasized to his liver, and after surgery and some chemotherapy, he only lasted a few more months. Looking back now, I wonder, you know, knowing what I know now, what could we have done different? He had the bad lifestyle, he wasn't active, he wasn't eating right, and he wasn't seeing his physician. And he never had a screening exam. Simple test done just a few years earlier could have caught this and he didn't have it done. So in closing today, I hope we've impressed upon you the importance of maintaining your health. <laughs> yeah, I like that one. <laughs> maintaining your health <clears throat> to reduce your risk factors for getting colorectal cancer, as well as using a validated screening program at the appropriate age. And appropriate age does not mean when I get Medicare, it's 50. Watch for signs and symptoms and be proactive and not reactive. Mm -hmm.